let's get started. So what is reinforcement learning? So I choose this definition because I really love it. It's, it, it tells you exactly what you want to do with it. So it's a way of programming agents by reward and punishment without needing to specify how the task is to be achieved. So it's a way that makes human able to, pro to program agents, software, robots, any intelligent entities uh, in a lazy way. So we don't want to invest a lot of time writing, hard coding, everything that the robot needs to do or that software needs to do. We just need to give the a robot or the software some uh, punishment or some encouragement and then we want the robot by itself to figure out how to solve the problem, how to find the solution. So it makes, it's very appealing because it makes the job of the human very easy. So you just tell the robot this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is good, and then the robot will learn how to do it, okay? As opposed to the classical approach, which consists in exactly writing, programming everything from scratch, which takes a lot of time, okay? So that's, that's the whole philosophy of reinforcement learning, which is also philosophy of machine learning, anyway. So this defi definition was taken from 96, from this article, these people are uh, leaders in the field. Um, so you can see that this area is a little bit old, so it started mostly in the late 80s, and um, it boomed recently, so it was, it was slowing down for like 2000, until 2010, 12, 13, and then it went up quickly recently. So, uh, so uh, let's look uh, uh, to an example of, of what we want to achieve through reinforcement learning or, or how we can do it. So uh, let's say you want to play a video game. How do you do it? So you observe screenshot. This is from Atari. I don't know if the lighting is, is, is good there. Maybe I can turn off the front light. Or it's good? You can see? Perfect. Okay. I'm not sure. So let's say you see some uh, video uh, screenshot. Okay. So you see something. And then you have... This is where your feedback, this is your uh, observation from the environment. And then you have some joystick, okay, where you can apply something, you can do something. When you do something, something happens here. And you can see that there is a score, okay? So you are, for example, die or you are winning. So there is some score. And then you'll be doing some random actions, you'll be exploring, and you will, uh, at the end, you'll figure out which actions will maximize your score. And then you will end up playing this game very well. So this is how we learn games. So we just have some observations, we just do something in return, and we, uh, we maximize these rewards. So this, this simple thing is maybe simplification of the whole, whole life, you know. Life is like this. So you observe certain things, and you do things, and you want to maximize your reward. So your reward could be surviving, it could be anything. So there is some, uh, something that you want to improve. And I would get back to, to, this, uh, to this particular application because it's, it's an important um, uh, ap standard application in reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is, is uh, inspired from biology. Um, so you have all seen these things, right? Where you have a mouse uh, in some cage. So there have been a lot of experiments like this. And the mouse does something. And then if it does what you want it to do, you give it some food. So you give it some reward. And if it doesn't do what you like it to do, well, you can punish it with some very mild electricity. Let's, let's not get there, but anyway. So you can either reward it or punish it. And then the mouse will figure out, if I keep doing this, for example, if I keep pushing the lever, I'll get a lot of food. It doesn't know why, but it knows that if each time I press the lever, I get some food. So this is something good to do. And if I do something bad, then I'll get some electricity. Um, so I don't want to avoid that. Uh, so this is called instrumental conditioning. So you condition the animal to do something. It's amazing the kind of things that you can achieve through this thing. So you can teach the mouse to jump. You can teach the mouse to do whatever you want. So basically what you are doing, you are programming a mouse to do things, right? So you can program a dog to, to do some, uh, some movements, right? Just by giving it some food. So this is a form of programming without having any access to its brain. So the only thing that you have is giving a reward or punishment. And then you will be able to program. So we want to apply the same philosophy for robots, for software, because it makes the job of human easy. And we can solve very complex tasks. For example, we can never uh, put chips on the mouse and, and program the mouse to do this. This is much easier to do. So there have been a lot of studies like this. Um, so we can, in this case, it was just uh, pressing some lever, but you can do much more complex things. Uh, so we can throw, put the mouse inside some maze, a huge maze, okay? And then you put cheese somewhere, okay? A piece of cheese somewhere. 
And then the mouse will be going like crazy around, left, right, left, right, and then one day it will discover the cheese, okay? And once it finds where is the piece of cheese, next time you put it back in the initial position, it will try to repeat the same thing. So he said, okay, last time I did this and they found something really good. I'm gonna try to repeat the same thing and maybe good things will happen again, okay? So in this case, the mouse will be choosing actions that don't have any immediate advantage, but the mouse knows that somehow in future, like one hour later, if I keep doing this, I will get to something good. So this is more like long-term planning. So the mouse is like doing actions that have effect in the long, long, long horizon, okay? which is opposed to this one, where you have immediate feedback, immediate reward. Uh, you press lever, you get food. But here you have to perform some actions, and then the food, you would get it after a long time, perhaps. So, and it's, it's amazing to see that most they can remember paths to get to food. Um, so this is also uh, an example of instrument uh, conditioning. So this area was studied a lot by this guy. So this is the leader of this area. His name is... B.F. Skinner, Skinner. Uh, you can uh, find a lot, lot of uh, YouTube videos. videos. So he was, uh, he had a lot of videos in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, he studied, studied a lot of pigeons and how they learn. And actually he's very eccentric, so uh, uh, his later years he was living with just pigeons and he was living alone and he was doing a lot of experiments. So he's a very eccentric guy, like crazy scientist, but he built this area in psychology. He's the father of behavior, behaviorism. And um, so he, pour, he noticed that, for example, if you take a pigeon like this, and you want to teach the pigeon to do something complex, for example, uh, the pigeon should press on a button that corresponds to the color of the object in the, in the picture. For example, if you have a yellow object, then the pigeon should press on yellow. And if it's a green object, then the pigeon should press on green. And then you give it food based on that. So the pigeon learns actually to perform the action or press on the button that has the same color as the image that comes in front. And the way he did this is just by giving it some food whenever it does something correct. So he was able also to teach the pigeon to make full turns. So actually I'm gonna show you I think some uh, video from, uh, from one of the experiments that he was doing and uh, it's really amazing how we can train pigeon to perform certain actions just in quest of reward, searching for reward. And the reward here is some food. Um, so the pigeon is just trying to get there. I'll just let you watch this because it's fun. And people have different interpretation of what's going here. So there are different interpretation of this kind of behavior, how it happens. <coughs> Almost there. And task is solved. So this requires, this is really, pigeon is like a very stupid animal. How did it learn to, per, to plan ahead? I need to put this and stand there. So we still don't have a robot that's able to achieve this simple thing. Right, so. You can find the, all these videos on, online, of course. Uh, they are very popular. Okay, okay, so, so let's, let's get a uh, little bit into how to formalize this problem, okay? okay. But keep but in mind that, that this is the kind of things that we want to achieve. achieve. So, so um, the, this, this loop, loop that I have there, where we have an agent environment, is like the first, first thing that you see in any textbook on reinforcement learning. learning. So, so it's, it's very standard, standard or, or any textbook, textbook on uh, artificial, artificial intelligence, actually. So some people say this is the global view of AI. So, so you have on one side one agent, on the other side you have the environment of the agent. The agent chooses some action, uh, applies the action on the environment, the environment returns some reward to the agent and tells it the state of the environment and then this is repeated again and again and again. Exactly. So the goal here is to, to learn to choose actions that will maximize the rewards. So we, we are greedy, want to win a lot, we want to be good, we want to feel good, so we want to choose actions that will maximize the reward. So th that's how uh, uh, 
animals and humans basically live or, or think, um, and this is how we want to program the agent. So this is another uh, uh, view, which is, uh, you will also find this a lot. So you have an agent, and when I say an agent, you always see a robot, okay? But a robot is just simple, uh, an easy way to illustrate an agent. In reality, it could be, you can imagine this as software, it's your cell phone, okay? So you do something, your cell phone does something, etc. You can interact with your cell phone. It could be a software, it could be anything. But of course, robots are easier to visualize, and uh, that's why you use them a lot. You will see them a lot in this uh, presentation. But when I, whenever I say agent or robot, don't think, or sorry, sorry, when I say agent, don't think only about robots, it could be anything. So, so the, the agent chooses some action, action, applies it on the environment, and then there is some reward that's given back from the environment to the agent, and reward is uh, recompense in French, okay, just to, to make sure the notations are clear, um, or terminology is clear, and then you have also some states, uh, so the agent observes the state of the environment and then chooses again some action, and this is repeated over and over, uh, forever, so this is lifelong uh, learning. Okay, okay, let's see some, some applications of our own. Okay, so before getting into the lecture, into the techniques, we need to know why do we study this? What is this used for? So uh, there, there, there have been a lot of applications, okay, but uh, I have to admit that oral is very challenging problem compared to other, I would say compared to other uh, supervised or unsupervised learning techniques that are, you have some data point and you want to predict some label, here you have to deal with some complex environment. Uh, so RL, reinforcement learning, is still behind other fields in terms of applications. So computer vision, you can find it on your Facebook, you can find it, it recognizes faces, it, it's, it's commercial. Um, speech recognition, same thing. Uh, so a lot of uh, techniques in, in, in um, in machine learning have been commercialized successfully. Reinforcement learning, there are, there are a lot of applications in real life of reinforcement learning techniques, but they are very simple versions of it. So you may think about like the cooling system as a reinforcement learning system. So you get some observation, temperature, and then apply some actions, which is cooling or heating the room to achieve certain uh, measure. So the, the philosophy of RL is applied basically everywhere, but the, the algorithms that we will present, they are still, I would say, they are still mostly at the research stage. Okay? Um, but there are some applications that I will show, some real applications that are very important. So let's start with the first one, which is fast robotic maneuvers. Um, okay, let's just do this once. And so this is one example of reinforcement learning. Uh, in practice, we want to have a robot that does this, that flips a pancake. And if you want to program a robot, I work on robots, if you want to program a robot to do this, it's super difficult. If you want just to write a program that takes observes the pancake and calculates velocity, uh, torques, it's super difficult to do it from an engineering point of view. But here, the way we're gonna do it, we can just give it penalty whenever the robot does something bad, we can sell it, tell it bad, bad the robot, and then whenever it does something good, we can tell it that what it did was good. And then the robot is just learning here, it fails at the beginning a lot, and then eventually it will figure out what is good by itself. Again. And now it's working, okay? So now it learned after, I don't know, 100 maybe trials, it learned how to do this task uh, successfully, okay? So th there have been a lot of applications like that. Do you have, uh, if you have question at any moment, just interrupt me, by the way. After 50 trials. So try it 50 times, and this is after 50 times, it learns how to flip a pancake successfully. And as I said, if you try to program this by hand, or if you want to write the code for this, it will take you months of coding, and you will fail. Uh, so another application is, sorry, is uh, this is another video of an application. So this came out last year from uh, OpenAI. So just watch this. And tell me what's going on.
Okay, I think that, that's, that's enough. enough. So, so, so the, the what we have here is simulator of, of a human or robot. Okay, so it has a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of angles, a lot of things. And you went to write software that will make this human run and walk, etc., which is very challenging problem. So it's difficult to make to write code that makes the human balanced and then to apply the right to keep balance to move forward, etc. And the way we, they solve this problem is by using reinforcement learning. So they said, let's let the robot program itself. Let's let the the software came up with its own code. And the way they do this is by only defining some reward or some punishment. So whenever the human moves forward, it will get a positive reward. And whenever it fails, it gets negative reward. And when I say the human, I mean the human simulation. Uh, so in the same way that they train the mouse to, to get to some goal. And uh, basically, that's it. So after a lot of trials, the, the, the robot will figure out, or the human will figure out, it's a human simulation. We figure out how to move, how to run. Now you observe something. The way it's moving is a little bit awkward. So the way it's, it's running, it's like crazy, right? It's doing all these things. The reason is because this thing was never specified. We didn't tell the, the, this robot how to walk. We just told, told it that if you walk, you would get positive reward. We didn't tell it, oh, don't do this awkward movement. We just told it, just move forward. I don't care how you move, OK? And then the robot figured out this kind of motions, OK? If you want to make it walk more like a human, uh, more like straightforward, then you have to penalize the certain motions. So all this is learned just from scratch, just uh, by, uh, without doing, with very little code. So if you see the code uh, that was, or the software that was, um, the implementation of reinforcement learning that was used for this application is very simple, just few lines. Few, few lines of code can, can get that. So, um, okay, let's just keep going. And uh, uh, so there will be actually another session also on reinforcement learning. So in this one, we'll cover the basics. And then second one will cover a uh, little bit more advanced, advanced, uh, advanced things. So this is another application, which is Atari games. You remember the Atari uh, video games, like Pong and Pac-Man and all these things. Um, so of course, it's, it's, it's not new to write uh, AI software that can play games. But what was new here is the following. The input of the agent is a screenshot. So the only thing that it sees is an image. RGB image, okay, red, green, blue image. And the output is an action on joystick. And just by using images and applying different actions, the software was able, or the agent was able to learn how to play this game, okay? So before, people, when they were writing code for playing video games, they, were, they had access to the software. They know where is the ball, they know everything. And then the, you, they, they, they have code some for playing the game. But what is new here is that this is like, it's learning like a human. So the input that the agent receives is just an image from screen, from the monitor, and the action is really physically uh, an action on the joystick to play. And it learned to, to play this, which is really amazing. So this came out like 2013 from DeepMind. It's very popular work now. Uh, and it was a big breakthrough in reinforcement learning. Um, because they applied exactly the same, uh, it was a neural network, by the way, they used exactly the same architecture for different games. And it was each time it was able to learn to play, uh, re regardless of how you define the game. You take this game, you change the rules, you change things, it will learn how to master it. Uh, it and in a lot of games, it was learning uh, better than humans. <coughs> okay, so. Then, uh, so we moved, that was in 2013, and then we moved to this a few years ago. This is called the Doom game, which is 3D. And again here, the input of the agent is the image. So the agent has only this image, and the output is some action. And then you have some reward. And then it will learn how to, from, from, from pixels, from these pixels, and the reward that it gets, it will learn which actions are good, which actions are bad. Okay? And then the point, of course, is that next step, we will move to real life. So, we, so you see that video games, games are just simulation of reality. We started with Atari, which is a very simple word. We moved into Doom game, which is 95, 96 uh, graf graphical 3D game. And the trend here is to move to videos and to real life and to apply the same reinforcement learning technique. So NVIDIA, for example, invested a lot of money in using this kind of techniques for self-driving cars. Okay, just, uh, this game is a little bit violent, but uh, you know, a lot of computer scientists are uh, nerds who like to play video games, so um, and they like all this kind of stuff. 
So, and then we have another application, which is power grid. So how can we manage the power, electricity on grid? How can we uh, distribute the power? So there is a lot of work on that. Networks, there is a lot of work. Then we have cooling systems. Um, where uh, DeepMind, so, so the company that made this video game, that, that used the reinforcement learning for video games, used the same techniques uh, for, uh, for managing the cooling systems of uh, Google. Okay? So the company that made the, Atari, the software that plays Atari games, it's, co it's called DeepMind, and this company um, was acquired by Google for half billion dollars, and then they deployed their technology on the uh, data centers of Google, and they used the reinforcement learning to manage the cooling system, and they saved the electricity bill by 40%. So thanks to this technology, Google is spending 40% less money on their cooling systems. Um, then you can apply the same techniques on automated, automated dialogue systems like question answering, Siri, these kind of things. So you can, uh, you can uh, look into actions as uh, questions or answers uh, when you are talking to some intelligent software. Uh, we have also recommender systems like online advertisements, uh, robotic manipulation. That's something uh, I, there, there are a lot of applications here, but I will show you something I did personally. So <coughs> what I wanted to do here is I built this setup and uh, I want the robot to pick the two objects, but uh, you, and the robot can either grasp an object or push an object, but as you can see, this is not easy, so I used the reinforcement learning where I, I didn't do much, so I just told the robot, if you manage to pick some object, I will give you a reward. If you manage to pick anything, you have a reward, and it's up to you. Learn how to do this. So the robot was just going around and trying crazy things. How can I pick these objects? He's trying to grasp them, and then eventually came up this strategy. I'm going to push the box. They will be separated, and then I can grasp them. You see? So it's not working until you push one box, and then they become separated, and then they will be grasped. So this strategy was discovered by the robot. I didn't program this behavior. This was behavior that surprised me. Actually, the behavior that I was expecting was that the robot will push the pipe, the white pipe, to the front, and then grasp the two things. But then it figured out that we can do this also, and it will work. So you can see that that's the, the, the cool thing about the reinforcement learning is that you can see, you can get things that you don't expect, um, and, without, and you don't have to program them. OK, so. Um, so basically, any complex system can be, uh, uh, can be formulated as a dynamical system that is uh, uh, controlled by an agent through actions and observation. Again, I think I'm going to skip this. I spent a little bit too much time on uh, the motivation intro, etc. I think everybody's ready to get into the um, uh, formalization of this problem. So uh, let's take an example, OK? Of, uh, uh, of uh, reinforcement learning problem. So let's say you have, uh, okay, let's start with some definitions. So first definition is what is state, okay? Notion of state, a notion of action. So state, for example, in, uh, state is a uh, snapshot of the world. In this case, for example, state is the position of the robot. And the action could be, for example, move east, move west, do something. So anything you do could be called uh, an action. Uh, so we have a simple example here. We have a robot and we have some target and you want the robot to move to the target. So we can discretize this environment into three by three grid, and each part of this grid will be defined as a state, okay? Uh, so we have state S1, S2, S3, etc. So we have a finite set of states that we can represent in a graph, for example, if you have discrete state space. And then you can represent transition between these states as edges, okay? So you can go from S1 to S2, from S2 to S1, from S2 to S3, etc. So this is what we call a Markov decision process. Uh, this is another example of grid world where you have a robot and the robot uh, wants to get to some target, okay? And there is some obstacle. In this case, there is a hole with fire. So this is just, of course, toy example, toy example. And then if the robot falls there, then it dies. If it gets to the goal, it will succeed. Of course, all the examples that they will be showing here, they are toy examples, but they are just to illustrate the complex, uh, more complex systems. <coughs> So, so and, and, and in this case, case the, uh, this is a top view of the same problem. You have a robot at some position, you have fire next to it, and then the robot can move forward. Uh, so we have two cases that we have to, we have to distinguish. So the first case is the uh, deterministic world, and second one is stochastic world. So there are two possibilities. In deterministic systems, if you do something, you know what will happen, for sure. So if I move forward, I move forward. There is no question about it. Okay? Okay. I am in full control of the system. 
in stochastic world, you, you do something and you don't know what happened. So you move forward, you may move, you may stay, you may go left, there is noise. There, is, there are things that are not up to you, right? For example, if you want to drive from here to home, in the next hour, you don't know if you will be home. Maybe there is traffic, maybe your car, your car will break. There are a lot of possibilities that can happen. You are not certain about the future. There are a lot of events that can happen, and each event will have some probability, and you have to take this into account to choose your actions. Okay, so this is what you call stochastic environment, where you do some action, and then uh, there are multiple possible next states that can happen uh, after that. So, the only thing that you need to understand very well about the reinforcement learning is this slide, and then the rest will be quite easy. So this is very important, which are the notations that we'll use and the definition of Markov decision process. So there are four elements that you need to know. The first one is denoted by S. We'll call it all, we'll use all the time S, which is state. Okay? The, state the state of the robot, the state, the state of the environment, the state of the world. And this is, uh, for example, position, velocity of the robot. So state tells you how things are at, at particular moment. And then you have the second thing, which is the action. The action, for example, force, move, go, answer question, buy some stock market, uh, say something, anything that you can do, any action in the world is, an action, is, is denoted by, by the, in the action set. Uh, of, course, of course, depending, depending on, the on the problem, problem you have to define your actions in certain way. Then we have the stochastic transition function. So, so we will consider the general case, which is the, the stochastic transition function, where uh, you have uh, a given state, st, and a given action, at, t denotes time, okay, time t. And if you choose action at in state st, you will get to st plus 1, but you have a distribution of st plus 1. So what we have actually is probability of st plus 1, because there are multiple possible outcomes. Uh, so we, do not, we denote this by uh, transition from S to S prime if I choose action A. Okay? If I am in S, in state S, and I execute action A, what is the probability that I will go to S prime? Okay? And S prime is any state. If you know this for all possible state, action and next state, then you have a model of your system, how it works. So this thing is transition from S to S prime if I execute action, S, uh, action A. And then we have the reward, of course. So the reward is some numerical function that tells you how good or how bad is your state. We get into examples of that. So again, as I said, I don't want to go into a lot of techniques. I will just show you one technique or two that are really used a lot, that are popular, and you will under... So by hopefully at the end of this lecture, you know a lot about reinforcement learning and how to use it for real applications. Uh, so again, so we have state, action, transition, and reward. This is definition of Markov decision process. And this is a graphical representation of the relationship between all these variables or all these things. So you, you start at some state S0, and you choose an action A0. Based on this state and this action, you will go to a new state, S1. And you get a reward, okay? You get some reward. It could be positive, it could be negative, but there is some score. Or it could be zero, zero special case. And then you are at S1. At S1, you choose again an action, A1. And based on the state and based on the action where you are, there will be a next state, okay? And then you get also a reward. And so on, and so on, and so on. So, and then your goal is just to maximize this reward. So you want to collect as much money as you want on the way, okay? So it sounds a lot like greedy, but you know, that's the best way to explain it. So, this is another example of Markov decision process. I'm sure that you all studied Markov chains, I think. Uh, so Markov decision process is just an extension of Markov chain. So what we have here is MDP, or Markov decision process, with three states, S0, S1, S2. So three possible configurations of the robot, or the world. And then we have two actions. We have A0 and A1. So if we are in state S0, and we choose action A0, then we will stay in state S0 with probability 0.5, and we will go to state S2 with probability 0.5, okay? So 50-50, if I choose A0 in state S0, I may stay where I am, or I may go to the next state S2. Now, if I am in state S2, and I choose action A0, then there is probability 0.4, which means 40% of the time, 40% of the time, I will go to S0, and 60% of the time I will remain in S2. So the numbers that you see there is just the probabilities uh, of moving from one state to another state if I choose an action or another action. 
Okay? So if I specify all this, then I have a model of the environment and I can work with that. I can just use this graph, these numbers, and I will figure out how to solve the problem. Okay? And then what you see there in the yellow arrows, negative one or plus one, are the rewards that you get, and the rest is zero. The, the other, in other states, we get a reward of zero. So I will show you uh, the, so, so the style I like to, to give lectures is, um, I give a lot of examples and I go again, over again, the same concepts. So if you miss me at some point, you will catch me up at another point. So even if you miss completely this, don't worry, oh, don't say that, okay, I lost everything. No, it's not like a chain. It's, there are a lot of things that are just repeat. Because this is, for example, another example that is more realistic. So let's say you have a car. And then the car could be in three states. It could be cool. It could be warm, it could be overheated, okay? So, in summer, we want to avoid overheating, so we don't want to be in that state. Well, if you are in a state where the car is cool and you uh, slow down, okay? So you, you decelerate, you slow the car. You are moving on the highway and the car is cool and you stop or you slow down. What happens is that for sure the car will remain cool. So if we choose the action of slow in cool, we will remain here. As long as we are slowing, we will always be cool. And this happens with probability one. There is no doubt about it, okay? And they will get reward of plus one because the car is cool, everything is good. But if you do this, you don't move anywhere. You have to speed up at some point. You have to go fast at some point. So if you accelerate, you go fast, then there is a chance, 50% chance, that your car will be warm because you are going fast the car will become warm with probability 50%. And there is also a chance that the car will remain cool because it's a very well-engineered car. There is cooling system. So there is 50% chance that you will remain in cool. And you will get... Uh, so if you go fast, then you will get a reward of plus two, which is better than plus one. So this is a risky action. Going fast is, has some risk that it will get you to warm case. However, we want to move fast. We don't want to go slow. So we have a reward of plus two as opposed to a reward of plus one if we are slow, if we are moving slow. Okay, now when we get the car to warm, okay, it's warm, then, and let's say you go faster, even faster, then you go to overheated state. That's terrible, and you get reward of negative 10. That's the worst thing that can happen. So your car will break, you will have to call, or you have to open, the car and check the engine. Uh, well, but if you are in warm and you slow down, then you move back to cool with probability 50%, or maybe your car will remain for some time, will remain uh, warm uh, uh, for, with probability 50%. And you get also a reward of plus one. So you see, this is not tr uh, trivial. What is, what is the best action to do at certain point is not like a trivial thing. You have to reason about the future about the long-term horizon. So let's say, for example, I have a huge penalty if I, don't, if I miss my flight, I'm driving to the airport, and if I miss my flight, it's much worse than if the car overheats. The penalty is $2,000 or something that I'm gonna lose, for example. Then, uh, then I don't care about this, right? I, I will go fast, because even if this happens, well, yeah, it's worse. It's not worse than missing flight. But if I'm just driving home, then I want to avoid this at any cost. So it depends on the goal, it depends on, you have to reasonable long horizon. Well, um, that's just, uh, okay, just quickly. So we have a robot, you have nine states here, and the robot could be in any position. Uh, so we have S1, S2, these are the possible positions of the robot. So here we have nine states as opposed to three states. And the actions that we can do is go west, go east, go north, go south, etc. So this is just another example. Um, um, so I think I have to keep an eye on time because they have the habit of always talking forever and over explaining. Um, so how am I doing on time? Can somebody tell me? 45? Okay, good. We're not bad. Okay. So, uh, well, now I, what I will do here, I will go dissect these things. I will dissect states, actions, transition, and reward. Okay? So we can look carefully into these, these concepts, because these are fundamental concepts. Once you understand this exactly, uh, I, I would say reinforcement learning is more like philosophy or ideology. Once you are, so I was telling uh, Jalal that, don't worry, I'm going to indoctrinate everybody about reinforcement learning, such that they will be ready for your talk. So it's more like 
uh, ideology of reinforcement learning, so I'm trying to push on you. And uh, once you, you get into it, then everything looks so cool to solve. It's a really cool thing to do. So again, I'm going to go through state space. What is the state exactly? What is state? So state is a representation of all the relevant information for predicting future states in addition to the information that you need for your task. So there are two things here. First thing is your state should contain everything you need to know about predicting the future. If, for example, the temperature of your car is important, include it in state. If the velocity is important, put it in state. So state put in it everything that you need to make predictions about the future. Okay? If the weather is not important, for example, we are inside, the weather is not important, it's not part of the state. Okay? Uh, if the time for my lecture is important, it's part of my state. So state is basically just some vector or some uh, data point that contains all the, the attributes of the state is everything you need to know to predict the next state. Okay, so this is kind of a recursive thing. So state contains everything you need to know to predict the next value of it. And then the other thing is you need to put in everything that's relev relevant to your task. Of course, don't put everything in the word in your state. Just put things that you need for your task. Okay, for the problem that you want to solve. Um, so for example, here we have S1 until S9. We have nine possible states, discrete states. The state can be finite, can be currently unfinite, or can be continuous. So you, you have all possibilities. We'll focus in this lecture only on finite state states state because they are easier. But actually, exactly the same definitions and same algorithms can be applied on continuous state spaces. Uh, and then the actions are, uh, what are the actions? So the actions are things that the agent does to modify, modify the state of the system. Okay? So anything that the agent can do, anything that it's in, uh, in, it's in possi it's, it's, its possibilities is called an action. Uh, the goal is to choose actions that will steer the system toward more desirable states and avoid dangerous states or bad states or things that uh, we don't want to do. Um, the action state also can be either finite, infinite, or continuous, but you focus only on uh, finite cases. And uh, in our example, the, the action space or the set of actions is uh, go north, go south, go east, go west, do nothing, which is also an action. So uh, we have a small number of actions. This is a very simple problem. Now, the transition function is the thing that links together states and actions. So the thing that links states into actions is given by transition function. I will say it again, so transition function takes state at time t, action at time t, and then it tells you the probability that you go to a specific state at t plus one. Okay? So if it's a model, probabilistic model that tells you how the system changes, the dynamics of the system, how does it work? Uh, this is very important, it's called transition function. So transition function can be either deterministic or stochastic. We'll consider only the general case, which is stochastic, because any deterministic system is also a stochastic system, uh, special case. So let's go back to Markov assumption. Why is this whole thing called Markov decision process? Markov, this Russian mathematician, who his name we find, whose name we find everywhere. So uh, why is it called Markov assumption? So this is interesting. Markov assumption says that uh, if you want to predict the future, if you want to predict the next state, st plus one, the next position of the robot, next position of the car, the next uh, state of the mind of the human that you are talking to, if you want to predict this, and you know the whole history from the beginning until time t, so you know the state at time zero, t minus two, t minus one, until the current state at time t, and you also know all the actions, you remember all the actions that you did from the beginning until the current time, so you remember all your history. The mark of assumptions tells you forget about history, you don't need that, the only thing you need to know is the current state and the current action. So it tells you there is no additional information in the history, in the past, everything is included in the present, which is real. So if, 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 you, if you know, so uh, I think it was Pascal, Pascal who said, the Pascal demon, he said that there is, if there is a mind who knows the position and velocity of each particle in the universe at a given moment, then that mind would be able to predict the next state. And uh, I think uh, there was, I think Averroes or I think Ibn Rushd said something similar uh, centuries before. So the, uh, of course, with quantum mechanics, we know that in, it's not possible to do this mathematically in a deterministic way. Uh, there are certain things that are inherently stochastic in the universe. Uh, but anyway, we are getting a little bit uh, here too philosophical. So the 
predicting the next state, st plus one, if you know the current state, st and the current action, um, can be done without uh, remembering all the history. So let's look into an example. Let's say you have self-driving car, and uh, this is uh, some um, simulation of, of car that drives, and you have other cars that are around you, and you observe them. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea. So if you observe the position, velocity, and acceleration of a moving car next to you at a given moment, then you don't need to know where the car came from to know where it's going to be next. Okay. If I'm driving and I see some car, and I see where it's going, the position, the direction, and I see the velocity, uh, you don't have to tell me that it came from uh, Harash or somewhere else, right? I don't care about the history, where, where the, what the driver did before. I can predict the next second where the car is going to be, because all the information I need, I can see it now, okay? So this is uh, called the Markov assumption. Of course, in practice, it doesn't, it doesn't work all the time. It's, it's more of an assumption, because uh, the state doesn't contain all the information all the time. So, but anyway, it's simplification that we do, and it holds often in practice. Um, so, okay. Um, we can go back to this uh, at the end. Certainly, if you have questions, we can discuss that, maybe. Um, so let's go into the reward function. So the reward function is some function that uh, codifies the preferences of an agent. Uh, so it defines what we want to do. It defines the task. It defines the problem. Okay. So uh, given so it's function that takes as input two things. So we call it R reward, and it takes as input two entities. What it takes is state, what is the position of the robot or the car or anything, and the action that you do there. What do you do in this situation? So given any state, any action, it gives you, it tells you how good is this or how bad is this. So reward is just some number: plus ten, minus ten, zero a number that tells you how good or how bad is this action and this state together, okay? You will find a lot of definitions in textbooks. Sometimes you will find the reward as the function of state only. Sometimes you find it as function of state and action. And sometimes you find it even as function of state and action and next state. So there are multiple definitions. We'll use this one, which is more standard. So the elegance of the MDP framework, Markov Decision Process, is that you can uh, model complex tasks by using rewards only. So by just using rewards, you can uh, define uh, a task. So let's look into examples of how to define a reward function. So let's say your goal is to fly a helicopter. You want a helicopter to fly, okay? You want autonomously, of course. So we can define a positive reward if the car is, is the, the helicopter is following the trajectory that I want. So I want the car, the, the helicopter to go around something, and then I can define my reward function as positive if we are close to the trajectory that you want to, to achieve, and you make it negative if you are further away from the trajectory, or if you crash, then that's terrible, then we give it very low reward. Let's say you want to beat the world champion in backgammon uh, game, or the AlphaGo, one of these complex games. So you can define a positive reward for uh, winning at the end, and negative reward if you lose. And, and then you let your agent learn how to do this. Let's say you want to manage an investment portfolio. So you have some money, and you want to buy some stocks, sell some stocks, or do some investment. Then you get positive reward for each time you have money in your, for each dollar that you have or each dinar that you have in your bank, and you have negative reward if you are losing money. Money, then you just let your uh, agent learn how to do this. Well, don't don't do this directly on your uh, bank account, of course. It will ruin you at the beginning, and then it will make you rich, but it's not guaranteed. So. Um, you want to control a power station. So we can define positive reward for producing power, and we can uh, also give a positive reward for being safe, for uh, achieving safety measures, and negative reward for uh, doing things badly. Uh, you want to train a human robot to walk, so we give it a, re a positive reward for moving forward, and give it negative reward for falling over. Uh, right. So you just assign some rewards, and then you let your algorithm figure out how to do things. You want to learn how to play Atari games, so define your reward function as positive if, if you have good score and negative if you have low score, etc. So uh, that's not a problem. So actually, once I was explaining uh, to high school students a reinforcement learning, and I told them reward is money, just to simplify things. I told them the robot, whenever the robot does something good, you get some uh, $5 or $10 given to the robot. And I told them, of course, it's okay, it's not really money, etc. But then the student kept insisting, how does the robot get the money? Do, do we like give it like money and then he puts it in his pocket or something like that? I told him, no, it's not that the robot gets money. We just make the robot think that he's getting money. We're like tricking the robot. We're telling him that this is a good thing and then he's doing that thing. 
So it's the same thing in our brains. We have this reward, uh, you know, dopamine and reward uh, uh, neurotransmitters that will make you feel good whenever you are happy or you are eating. Or, and uh, we are programmed to do things that will release this, this, uh, these uh, neurotransmitters that will make us uh, happy. So um, let, let's look quickly also into some examples. Let's say you want to balance, uh, one, this is a very popular example in uh, reinforcement learning. So Jalal will talk about, uh, we'll show you some, some uh, ways to solve this problem. This is called the cart pole, or some people call it the inverted pendulum. And the, this task is you have something like this, and you want to learn how to balance it, right? So you want to learn to move forward and backward such that this thing doesn't fall. Uh, so we need to find the accelerations or forces that will do this. What is the state in this case? Okay, let's go, let's formalize this as Markov decision process. The state is the angle, the angular speed, the position, the horizontal velocity of this ball. So the angle theta, the angular velocity, the angular acceleration, uh, maybe the position of this uh, thing, this is called the state. The action that we can do here is the horizontal force that we apply on this car. So it's just a vector of force, right? Newton. Uh, and then we have uh, reward. And the reward, let's say it's plus one whenever this pole is standing, and zero if it's falling or if it's down, etc. And that's it. And then take your favorite reinforcement learning algorithm, put this as input, and then let it figure out how to solve this problem. Don't worry about how it works, it will figure out the solution. The same thing, we can take the same algorithm, we apply it on these things, and it will figure out the solution. In this case, the state is the angle and position of the joints. So it's important to start paying attention to some details here. Uh, we are moving to more uh, concrete things here. We are specifying uh, the notions uh, more clearly. So the state here is the the angle of uh, sorry the angle of the joints. So when I say joints, is whenever there is connection between two uh, components. So we have the angle between them and the, the position of the joint in space. And you can also consider angular velocity of the joint. Uh, and you do this for all the joints in the body, and this gives you a description of the state. The actions that you apply are torques, or forces, if you want. So torques um, are the, uh, the actions that we apply. And then we have a positive reward each time we are standing, a negative reward of zero if we are falling. This is how you formalize this problem. By the way, this was taken from OpenAI Gym, which is, uh, OpenAI is an organization found, founded by uh, Elon Musk for promoting safe AI. And they have a lot of interesting things that you can find uh, online. This is called the Mujuko Simulator. It's free, you can download it and start playing with, uh, with these things. Um, video games, so what is the state here? The state is the pixels. So. This is more challenging, much more challenging, because the state here is, the dimension of state space is, let's say, 480 times 640 times three colors, red, green, blue. So all the image together, taken together, is a state. The whole image together is state. So we have a huge number of states here, right? It's very big. And the actions that we can do here is uh, moving left, moving right, down, etc. So if you have like joystick, you man it uh, to play uh, video games, uh, or anything that you can do with it is called um, an action. Okay. Why is there so much interest in video games uh, in in, uh, in research on reinforcement learning? Why are people, why why are companies like Google interested in playing Atari games? Why did they invest half a billion dollars on acquiring a company that plays video games? The reason is because the skills or the techniques that we develop for solving these problems can be used for self-driving cars, can be used for robots, can be deployed to real life because games are just simplification of reality. And if you go further, if you see the current video games that we have these days, they are almost indistinguishable. They are very real. Uh, they have very real graphism and physics. So uh, that's why a lot of people are working on that. So there is this Go game, which is very challenging, much more challenging than chess. The number of co positions that you can have here is orders of magnitude more than chess. chess. It wasn't solved until 2015 or 16 uh, when the uh, uh, DeepMind company used um, the uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, deep reinforcement learning, uh, and they were able to beat the world champion in this game. Um, and uh, in this case, the state is the position of all the pieces. The action here is where to put the next piece, and the reward is plus one if we win, and zero if we lose. Okay. Enough with the service you can see now, enough with the warming up and the applications and the fun. We're going to get into another kind of fun, which is mathematical fun. And it's going to be more about math. Okay? So how do we actually solve this? 
We are computer scientists. We are not just interested in looking into applications. We want to do this. We want to invent new techniques. So. Um, th there is one thing uh, I want to talk about, which is the horizon. How many horizon means, planning horizon means how many steps ahead do you take into a mind, in your mind, uh, do you take into account in your mind when you choose your actions? How, how much further in the future do you think? This is called the horizon. So we denote it by H, and it, it denotes how many actions in the future we care about. Okay? So some people have a horizon of one. They just, they just care about, about immediate, immediate reward. I, want, I see something, I want to eat it. And they don't care what happens later. If it will kill. Uh, I, I see something, people who, who are like criminals, you know, they don't think about going to jail because their horizon is very limited. They just think about immediate rewards. Smart people, they tend to have very long horizons. They think about all the consequences. If I do this, this will happen, and then this will happen, etc. So the horizon defines how smart you are or how, how much things in the future you take into account. But of course, the longer you look into the future, the slower you think, right? You cannot just think about uh, until the end of your life to make decisions about uh, what to eat or what to eat today. Or, so uh, this horizon decides how much you care about future rewards. We denote it by H. So basically we care about rewards from, we care about the rewards from time T until time T plus H and we stop there. I don't care about what happens later. It's too complicated. I cannot handle it. Okay? So we just handle from T until T plus H and this is my horizon of thinking. Some people have a horizon that stops here. So I eat something. It feels good. I'm going to eat it. Some people think about much future reward, okay? And the goal here is to maximize this thing. So I define my horizon from T till T plus H, and they want to maximize the rewards that they get there. Okay, so the horizon in this case is finite, but we, in theory we can consider also infinite horizon. We can look much in the future, but we have to do something there. We cannot just consider uh, infinite sum. We have to do something that I will tell you what it is. So the, if the horizon is finite, then the optimal action of the agent doesn't dep de uh, depends only on, not only on state, but also on the remaining number of steps, steps until the end. I will explain this. So let's say my horizon is finite. I have a horizon of, of two. I, I have only two seconds left to live. Okay? So this robot has only two seconds and then it dies. Its battery dies, okay? There is no, no more uh, thing, it turns off. It has a horizon of two. And does it make, and the goal is here, to get here, okay? Right? So if it gets here, it has some very high reward. But if it doesn't get, then it's a waste of time. Does it make sense to move or not? So let's say the horizon is two seconds. After two seconds, it's over. We, we turn off the robot, we stop. So we can only do two actions, or this and this, okay? But the goal is much further in the future. Is it a good thing, an optimal action, to move or not? It's not optimal, because it's just a waste of the robot. It's better just to stop. If you don't have enough time, there, you, you will not get your reward anyway, your horizon is limited, we stop there, then just don't do it. But if the horizon is infinite or very long, then it becomes an optimal thing to move to get your, your, your reward. Okay? So you see that depending on how long you define the horizon in the future, things that look optimal become suboptimal, things that are suboptimal can be optimal, so it all, it's, it all depends on how many steps you consider in the future. So let's say you have, uh, I don't know, let's say you have uh, uh, okay, I'm not going to give, uh, I, I tend to give morbid examples. I was going to say, let's say you have a week to leave, and what are you going to do with that? All right, yeah. So the horizon is how many steps ahead you think you will leave? How many days or seconds in future? all the possibilities in three moves, okay? But considering everything that can happen, but you, ha you know that you have only three possibilities, okay? It's the same thing when you are solving an uh, exam and you have only five minutes left, uh, so then it becomes like, if, if you don't have five minutes, it makes sense to solve everything. If you have only five minutes, solve the easy questions quickly and get your, you see? So the optimality of, of, of something you do depends on how much time you left. So let's say you are solving some exam and you have only five minutes now left, Let's not waste our time on the difficult proof. Let's solve the easy questions and maximize our return, okay? <coughs> so if we consider, uh, so, sorry, uh, time, how long is it now? One hour, I have one hour left. 
Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So, so maybe I will slow, slow down. down. I was I going was like going crazy. Like okay. okay, but it's fine. fine. We'll discuss if I if finish uh, earlier. We'll. Uh, by the way, don't, don't be worried about the number of slides. There are just lots of uh, uh, sparse slides. So, so okay. okay. If we have infinite horizon, if we want to maximize the sum of the rewards until infinity, let's say you will live, you think that you will live forever, okay? Can you sum the rewards until infinity? That becomes infinity. It's, it's not a number that we can make anything about it. It will just give us infinity or maybe it doesn't converge. Or, so we have to do something. The thing that we do if we want to consider infinite horizon, so we don't have limit in time, you have you to have use to something use which is called discount factor. factor. This discount this factor is denoted by gamma, gamma and it's and just a number between 0 and 1. And, and whenever, whenever we go further, further in the future, in our reasoning, we will raise this gamma to power of 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Until, until infinity. And, and since it is a number between 0 and 1, and one for example, it's 0 0.8 or 0 0.7, then the next, next step, step is going to be 0 0.7 times 0 0.7. And then the next, next step is going to be 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 times 0. It will just go down and down and down. Which means that these numbers at the beginning, they have very high uh, influence. They are very high. And then whatever you have here is going to zero. So after like 10 steps, it's almost zero, zero points. It doesn't matter much, right? So this is a trick that we do such that we can sum an infinite series, but just uh, using some discount factor and then raising the power of this discount factor. Of course, it has interpretations. We don't do this just for like this. So can you tell me what's the rational behind using this discount factor? Why, why do I uh, add this multiplier, uh, which, uh, this factor, which is gamma, and uh, multiply it by the rewards whenever I'm thinking about something in the future? Which means that if I have something uh, closer to the present time t, it will, be, it will have a high weight or high importance, but if it is too far in the future, it will have very low importance in the sum. Yes? Incertainty about what will happen. But that is already taken care of in the transition model. So your transition model will take care of the fact that you are not certain about the future. Uh, the transition matrix. So at the end, we'll, we'll show how to, to solve actually this problem. And you see that transition function itself will tell you that the future things are very uncertain. But there is no other reason for that. Yes? Yeah? That's, uh, yeah, that's one advantage, which is just computational. Uh, just to make the problem easy, we, we just take this gamma, and then that means that everything much later will be almost zero. That's just like computational advantage. But is there like an interpretation practice? Yes. The? The time percent. The time percent. Yeah. yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's uh, exactly, it's like another way to push the robot to do things quickly. So if you don't use this and you tell it you will get a reward, I don't care if you get it now or 10 steps in future, it, will, it doesn't make sense, in, it doesn't make any difference in this sum. Let's say there is some very high reward and you don't use this discount factor, then the robot can say, okay, I will do it like 10 steps later and then it doesn't make any difference. But if you start multiplying by this discount, uh, factor, then if it happens later, then you tell it, okay, it's not as important as now. Um, okay, another interpretation of this discount factor is the probability that you will live until that time. So the robot, you plan about the future, right? Uh, and you want to maximize the reward for next year, next, next year, etc. But do you know, uh, you are not, sorry, you are, you are not sure, certain that you will be alive then. So you have to consider this discount factor that says that, well, five years from now, we don't know if, it's going, if I'm going to be around, right? So we care more about the present time. The robot, the same thing. So the robot can plan things, but maybe its power will die. Maybe it will have a mechanical problem, right? So things in the future become... Uh, less, less certain, certain as, as you as said, said also, also in this case. Uh, so that's so why we have this discount factor that tells us that forces us or pushes us to do things early on. Um, some people see it as like interest rate in, in, in banking, like, uh, uh, well, that's more like just the mathematical thing. Um, let me give you another example. So if I, uh, if I tell you, I give you 10,000 dinars now, you take them and you go home, or I give you 
30,000 dinars next month. You prefer something immediate, right? Next month, I don't know if I'm going to see you. Let's, let's take 10,000 dinars now. And uh, OK, I don't care much about the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe uh, you, know, you will move. Maybe you will change your mind. Maybe things. So this just reflects that in, there is this, in psychology, we always prefer things that are immediate because they are guaranteed, basically, than things in future. Because as you said, also, because there is this uncertainty. So we just, we just prefer immediate things than future things. This is why we use this discount factor. Uh, factor discount in French, or uh, amortisseur, a factor d'amortissement, uh, to, uh, to reduce the future rewards, the importance of future rewards. OK, so all this is fun, all this is games. Let's get to what we need to do, the task. What do we do with that? OK? okay. So, so, so far, we were just defining things, defining states, defining rewards, defining transitions, definitions, definitions. But what do we want to do? What you want to do, what you want the robot to do is to find what we call a policy. So this is what reinforcement learning is after. This is what Markov decision process research is after, is how to find a policy. What is a policy? A policy, pi, it's always denoted by pi in reinforcement learning, it's function that takes as input a state and returns an action. So basically, it's function that tells you what to do. It tells the agent what to do. If you are here, do this. If you are there, do that. If you are in this position, go up, up. If you are here, go down. If you are near some car, try to turn left and avoid it. If you are, so basically, it defines what to do. This is control or a controller, for example, for people from control engineer. Um, so it's function that takes state and return action, returns an action, and this is what we want to find. Okay, so everything about reinforcement learning is about finding this policy, and the rest of the presentation is about that. So let's give some examples of policies before getting there. So this is one possible policy. If I am here, I do this. If I am here, I do that. If I am here, I do this. This is policy. And what I have here is try to do this. Doesn't mean that if I am here, I do this, I will end up here. No, this is not up to you. What you can do is just do things, and then things can happen as you want, or they may not happen, right? The system is not always deterministic. You are here, you try to go up, maybe you will stay here, maybe you will go here. You don't know, maybe you will, there are things that you don't know that can happen. You are in Babzoar, you want to go to, I don't know, Algiers Centre, right? And, uh, well, maybe there is traffic, maybe your car doesn't work. There are a lot of uncertainties about the, in the world. You want to invest in something, maybe the stock market will go down, will go up, etc. So these are the actions that you do, and then the transition function will take this action and the state, and it will tell you what's the probability of this and what's the probability of that. So this is one possible policy. This is another policy, and this is an optimal policy for this problem. So this is a random policy. A random policy means that in any state, just randomly flip a coin and do whatever you want, okay? So it's just like crazy policy, doesn't know what it's doing, it's just doing anything, anywhere. It's called a random policy. This is the worst possible policy. If you're an enforcement learning algorithm, doesn't do better than a random policy, that's embarrassing. So it's always like this. Sometimes I run some uh, reinforcement learning algorithm and they see how it's doing. And then I think it's doing well, and then I say, okay, let's, let's run a random policy and see how the random policy is, is doing, how much reward it's getting. I find out that it's not much better. That means that you are not, what you are doing is not that smart. You could just put a monkey or something like that, and you would be doing the same thing. So, and then we have the optimal policy, which is trying to go to some goal. Okay, I didn't show the reward function here. I just showed you the actions. Can you, from here, just infer what's going on? Just by observing the fact that this is the best thing to do, and this is random, and this is bad, can you tell me what is the reward function behind this? What is the goal of the, these policies? Yes. We're trying to go to the star, right? To one of the stars. OK. But there is something strange. So clearly, we're trying to reach the star, which is the goal. But why, when I am here, I'm, I'm not going up, but I'm trying to go here to escape? Why is this happening? That means that certainly in the reward function, there is something bad about this region, okay? So we didn't show you the reward function, but if I show you the reward function, you will see that this region, there is some negative reward. Maybe there is some lot of obstacles. Maybe there are humans there, etc. So the reward function behind this behavior, I didn't show it, but you can clearly see that there is some very high reward going on here, and there is some negative reward going here that pushes us to go away and go around. What I, you just did here is called inverse reinforcement learning. Inverse reinforcement learning. 
Reinforcement learning, you give a reward function and you find optimal behavior. In inverse reinforcement learning, you observe the optimal behavior and you think what is the reward function behind that. Uh, so this is just something I mentioned. I'm not going to talk about it in this presentation, but it's an area of research where people look into behaviors, uh, optimal behaviors, and they try to understand what is the reward function behind it. For example, a robot wants to learn how to do something, like how to play ping pong. So it we did this, actually an experiment like this when I was at the Max Planck Institute. So we have a human who plays ping pong, and we went to a human expert, actually, who was playing ping pong for 10 years. He was a champion, and we captured the motion of the human, how he is playing, and we wanted to solve the problem through exactly the question that I asked you, what is the human trying to achieve? We figured out that the human is trying to send the ball very close to the net, to the edge. So he was trying to do certain things to maximize, uh, to win the game. Uh, so the question of taking an optimal behavior and going back to the reward function is called the inverse problem of reinforcement learning. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. You understand, you can infer. So what she's saying is that sometimes maybe... You, you very good. So let's say you are driving and you are Google Maps uh, it collects your GPS data and it will observe that humans, strangely, whenever they get to some location, they go around. And everybody is going around. Then Google Maps understands that there must be some penalty there. There must be a reason why people. This is the inverse reinforcement learning problem. But anyway, let's let's stay on the reinforcement learning. Let's see how we can solve it before getting to inverse reinforcement learning. All right. So now we understand all the definitions. We know what is a policy. Now the question is, what makes a policy better than another policy? How do we choose which policy is better? Right. How can we rank policies from the best to the worst? How can we choose the policies? And this is a key problem. So we're going to define something that we call the value function. And the value function is a function that will tell you how good or how bad is policy. Well, you already, I already said it many times. So a value function, you know that we care about rewards. So a value function is a function that we not by, denote by V. V pi, pi, policy pi, pi. and uh, what it returns is the sum of discounted rewards that are expected to be received. So it's a function that tells you that tells you if you if you follow this strategy, this is how much you will get. Okay. If you follow the advice of this policy, this is how you get. Okay. How much you get, and then it's up to you if you want to follow it or not. And your goal, of course, is to find the policy that will have the highest rewards. So formally, it's defined like this. We can consider the infinite horizon case, because it's much easier actually to reason about. We can sum from t equals 0 till infinity, time t equals 0 till infinity. We're going to take the discount factor gamma, which is number between 0 and 1, like 0 0.9. 0 .9. We can raise it to power t, time, which means that if something is happening much in the future, uh, we care about it less. It will have less impact on the value function. OK, so what do we have here? What we have here is the reward that we will get in state st if we choose action, the action that is given by policy pi. Okay, the policy is fixed. We just want to evaluate the policy to know how good it is. Why do I have an expectation here over st? Why don't I have just a reward of st? Question for the for you. So why in this definition I have this expectation operator and I just don't have the sum of future rewards? Okay, okay. we'll say it again. again. So, so what we have here is the, uh, some function that takes as input some policy, and we want to calculate the sum of discounted rewards that we will receive in the future. So how, many, how much reward we will get in the future? And uh, we are summing from time t equals 0 till infinity, so we consider all the time in future, but we are considering discount factor, which means that we care less about things in the future, and we are just summing rewards. So we are just taking the rewards that we get in state S0, S1, S2, S3 in the future. But I put expectation here. I didn't put the sum of rewards. Esperance. Why? No idea. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because I don't know what's going to be next state or next next state. I don't know. I, I have all possible paths that can happen, and they can only calculate the probability. It's not deterministic system. 
If I follow, if I start executing these policies, well, this rewards the states that you will be in is not deterministic. Uh, even for just the next immediate state, I have maybe four or five possibilities. Let's say you have a robot and the robot moves forward. Well, it may move, it may make an error, it may stop, it may break, it may... There are a lot of possibilities. So you cannot say that, oh, you just do this and you get this reward of 10. No, you get a reward of 10 with probability 90%. You get a reward of 0 with probability 5%. You get a reward of 5 with probability 5 So you have all possible next states because the system is stochastic. It's not deterministic. Then you have to take the expectation. Okay? And the, 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 this expectation or these probabilities are given by transition function. So again, if you don't understand this, you will understand next slide, okay? Next, next slide. So it's not, it's, everything is related. So let's take this equation and see what we can do with it. The value function of policy. So this is a function V pi S. It takes as input to policy pi, and it tells us how much reward we get in the future if we start from state S, okay? So it's a function of where you start. This S here is the starting state. Okay. Let's, Let's try, try to work, work with this equation. equation. So, so I just I wrote just a definition. definition. Then, then I didn't do anything here. What did I do? I just, just took this sum, sum that starts, starts from, from zero, zero and it and goes until infinity, infinity. And I wrote it as the first, the first term. term. I just, I just took, took the first term, term of this sum, sum out and the remaining is still is inside. inside. So I just so took one of the terms, which is t equals zero. And I put it separately and everything is left, is left inside, inside the sum, the sum. Okay? okay? So the first term is gamma power zero times reward in, in starting state S and uh, choosing the action that's given by policy pi. So this is just the first term of, term of this sum, okay? But this sum now is starting from one instead of zero. Okay, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything either. I just took the gamma here, which was gamma power t, and I took it out and it becomes gamma power t minus one. Okay? okay? And then you have the gamma outside. It's just factorization. Okay? It just factorized. I just took gamma out. So I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I just took t, uh, uh, sorry, t minus 1, and I called it t prime. Okay? So t minus 1, I call it t prime. So we define new time, which is called t prime, and it's defined as t minus 1. Okay, okay, so, so if, t, if t if t starts from one, then t minus one starts from zero. Okay. okay. So, so since I have here t, t prime, which is defined as t minus one, and if t starts from one, then t minus one should start from zero. Okay. Just definition. And then the um, um, the starting state here. So for the the remaining of this sum. The initial state, S0, is given as the next state, okay? The next state which is given by a transition function. So here, the initial, before the initial state was state S, but since I am, T prime is the next, uh, sorry, uh, T is the next time step, then um, the, the initial state now is the next state, okay? S0 is the next state, which is given, distributed as this transition probability distribution. So the initial state now is the next state, Okay? okay, and that's, that's it, basically. It. No, the only thing I'm doing here is I am, I am replacing this expectation of operator with its actual definition. What is the definition of an expectation? The expectation, definition of an experience, is you sum over all possible random variables that you have, you take their probabilities, and you multiply it by whatever you are estimating the, esti the expectation for. So the possibilities are here are all the possible states, so I'm going to sum over all the possible states. I will take the, the probability of S prime, and the probability is given as the transition function S pi of S and then S prime. So we have the probability of going from S to S prime, and then you multiply this probability by the sum of rewards in the future. Okay? And, and this is just definition of expectation. The sum here, probability times number, is just, just definition of expectation of S t prime. Okay, then... You will observe one thing now, which is now things will simplify. This beautiful thing about math is that things get complicated, complicated, and then you simplify things, and they look beautiful at the end. So now the only thing I did is notice what we have here. What we have here, the sum from t prime equals zero till infinity, gamma power t prime, s t prime, etc. This is the definition of v pi of s prime. 
This is the, the, the exact definition of a value function, but it is value function that starts at the next state as prime instead of the current state. So what we have here is V pi of S prime, the value function of policy pi starting from the next state S prime. What is next state S prime? I don't know it. That's why I'm summing over all possible next state S prime and multiplying by the probability. That's why I'm taking the probability, the expectation. So, the, what do we have here? So we simplify things. We have no reward plus discount factor times the sum over the possible next state times the value function at the next state as prime. Can you notice something nice here? Just forget everything in between. Just look at the last line and the first, first thing that we have on the top, on the left. What do we have? Say it. So just, so just, just to observe, observe the last, the last line, line, last equation, last equation and the first thing. thing. I will give you a hint. Recursive function. It's a recursive function. And it's the same thing that v pi of s is a function of v pi of s prime. The value function in state s is a function of the value function in the next state. So we have this recursive equation. And computer scientists love recursive things because they are easy to implement and solve and just by just using iterative algorithms. So the equation that we got at the end is this. V pi s equal the value function of policy pi starting in state s is the immediate reward plus discount factor times the sum over the next state of transition function from current state to the next state times the value at the next state. Okay? If you discovered this in the 50s, it would be called your equation, but it was discovered by Richard Bellman, so it's called Bellman's equation. So it's not a difficult thing to do, you just have to do it before everybody else, and you get your name on some equation. So Richard Bellman invented dynamic programming, and you know dynamic programming, you studied it in, studied it in algorithms, and uh, he worked on, on this kind of problems, and he, he found out this formulation of, of planning problems, of MDPs. It's called the, the Bellman equation. So what is Bellman equation? It tells you that the value function is the immediate reward plus discount factor gamma times the expected value for the next state. What is nice, uh, sorry, uh, what time is it now? 30? Half, good. So the, this is a recursive equation. And what is beautiful about this is that we don't have to care about all the future. I don't have to care about next uh, 10 steps, 100 steps. It's all included in this recursion. I just, the value of some policy is the immediate reward plus discount factor times the expected value of the next state. And the expected value of the next state itself is defined in the same way, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this recursive equation makes me think only about my immediate reward and the value that I expect at next state. And the value that I expect at next state itself is also based on the next next state, etc. So these recursive equations make things much easier. Okay? Um, so the goal now is to find what we call pi star. What is pi star? It's the optimal, it's the optimal policy, which means that it's the policy that has the highest uh, value among all possible states. So there is one, there is not just one. There may be a lot of optimal policies, but uh, Bellman proved that any finite state, finite action, MDP has an optimal policy. So, uh, so in his seminal work on dynamic programming, Richard Bellman proved that a stationary deterministic optimal policy exists for any discounted infinite horizon MDP. So if you take any Markov decision process with finite state and actions, you can always solve this problem and come up with pi star, and pi star is the best or the holy grail the optimal, optimal thing, thing that we are looking for, which is, which is the, the policy, policy that has the highest possible value among all others. Okay, okay. So, so I'm going to uh, skip certain things, and um, I'm going to go directly to some algorithms now to show you how we solve this, now that you understand all the definitions. So the, let's start with planning algorithms. So we have two types of algorithms. We have policy iteration and value iteration algorithms. So this is for finding the optimal policy pi star. And uh, we can do this if we know everything about our problem. If we know the reward, we know transition, then we can apply these algorithms to find the optimal policy. So policy iteration, the way it works is, we'll, I will start with policy iteration algorithm. So the way it's, it works is very easy. You just pick any policy pi t, and policy, as I said, is a function that takes states and gives you an action. So choose any policy you want, okay? Let's call it pi zero. 
and then calculate its value. It is called v pi zero. So estimate, solve the Bellman equation to get v pi zero, and then improve the policy. And I will explain how to improve policy. If improve the policy to go a slightly better policy, which is called pi one. And then calculate the value of this policy pi one by solving Bellman equation, and you get the value of pi one. And then based on these values, do small improvement, slightly better policy. You go to pi two, etc. So just an iterative process where we take policy, we evaluate it, we improve it a little bit, we get a new policy, we evaluate the new policy, we improve it until we convert to the optimal policy. And you can prove that this process can convert to the optimal policy. Um, so how do we, let's start with the first step. How do we evaluate policy? How do you solve Bellman equation? So let's say you have some policy, fixed policy, and you want to calculate the value function of the policy. So again, just use an iterative algorithm, which is the following. Initialize the value as zero everywhere, or anything you want, and then just recursively apply this equation. Uh, take the values, put them here, multiply them by the probabilities, times the discount, add the reward, you get new values, and then you put back the new values. So you just do this operations again. It's a recursive thing. You can initialize the values wherever you want. You always converge. You always convert to the same solution. It doesn't matter how you initialize this, these numbers, v, k, as parameters, which are the values. So you convert to some value function. Um, I have more details, but I think I spent more time on the introduction. Uh, I, in my opinion, understanding the concepts is more important than details, because the rest you can uh, just find it anywhere. But uh, once you understand all the definitions, that's the most important thing. So, uh, okay, let's look into the other thing, which is policy improvement. So now we, we have a policy and we calculated its values. How do I get slightly better policy? How can I improve the policy that I currently have? Okay, that's very important thing. That's, that's very important. So let's say I have some policy and I know the values of the policy, I want to get the policy which is slightly better. What I do is the following. In all the states S, okay, I go through all my states, one by one, and in each state I will list all the actions that I have, and for each action I will calculate the immediate reward of that action in that state, and I will add to it discount factor times the sum over, S, the sum over next states as prime, the probability of going from S to S prime times the value that I already computed, okay? So I'm doing all this based on values that I already have. I have already some values for some policy, and I'm just trying to improve the policy a little bit. So I will just go through all states, I will list all possible actions, and I will calculate the immediate reward plus discount factor times the sum over next states, transition to next state times the value. So, and then what I need to do, of course, is to take the best action, okay? So this doesn't mean that this action is the optimal thing to do. It may change next time. Uh, it may change uh, when you would get new values, right? Because this is an iterative process. But it will incrementally improve the policy until you get to the optimal policy. Uh, I will put the slides online for the example that you can play with, but uh, I have like full numerical example of how to calculate this. I'm going to move to, um, we have another algorithm which is called value iteration. It's almost similar. So actually value iteration is much easier. This is a very simple algorithm as you can see. It has only this main operation. So the way it works is the following. Just initialize your values to anything you want, like random numbers. And then repeat these operations and then you will find the optimal policy. It's really easy. So the way you do it, initialize to anything you want, and then go through all the states and all the actions, calculate the reward plus discount factor, and choose the best action, and also change the value based on the best action. So this, this does both policy evaluation and improvement at the same time. It, it solves Bellman equation, and it improves it at the same time. So it has this max operator and this recursive operator in the same operation. And then, and then you will you find, find the optimal, optimal. Uh, at the end you will convert to the optimal policy. All right, all right. So, so this is all interesting, but what do we do when we don't have transition function? As you can see, to do anything that I said before, you need to know the transition probabilities from S to S prime. And this, these are the probabilities of how the robot work or how the world works, but nobody knows this for real. So, so what do we do when we don't have a model? Let's say I just want to balance this. Do I have any probabilities about how it falls or how it stands? I don't know. I just know the rewards that I get from that. So how do you solve this problem? 
This is the, the most of research in reinforcement learning is about that, okay? So how to learn to perform actions when you don't know the transition function. So basically what you, the way you do it is by trial and error. You fall, you stand, you fall, you stand, until you find out your solution at the end. So there are two ways to solve re uh, reinforcement learning problems. The first one is called model-based methods. So the idea of model-based methods is to estimate this transition function. Just, Just learn, learn this, this and then use, use the previous, previous things, things that I was talking about, about. Okay? okay? Use the use policy iteration or value iteration algorithms that I described in the previous slides based, based on the estimated, estimated probabilities, probabilities, probability of going from S to S prime, which is action A, okay? okay. So, uh, just, just collect a lot of data, data state, state, action, next, next state, 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 action, next state, state, state do things and collect data, and then based on the data, calculate what is the probability that you will go to S prime if you are in state S and you execute action A. You build a model, probabilistic model of how the system works. And this is a very simple way to build a model. So you, basically, if you want to know the probability of S prime given S and A, just count how many, many times you have S, A and S prime and divide it by how many times you have just S and A. This gives you the percentage of the time that you are in S and A and you do go to S prime, okay? So this is just frequency. So basically, what's the frequency of S, A, S prime? Uh, divided, divided by the frequency of just S and A, state and action. This gives you the conditional probability. So basically just repeat things and calculate the probabilities based on what you see and then use your uh, uh, policy iteration algorithm or value iteration that we uh, briefly explained before to solve this problem. So then there is another family of methods in reverse learning which is called model-free approach. So model-free says that, oh, you don't have to do that. You just, just based on rewards, you can learn what to do. So these methods, they are usually, uh, they don't require to learn a model. That's a beautiful thing. You don't need to learn transition functions. They are more robust to modeling errors. Why? Because whenever you start building a model, you, are, you, are, you have a bias. You are forcing things. I want to use Gaussian distribution with this and with that. Maybe it doesn't work, right? So you, whenever you are trying to model things, uh, your modeling can be completely wrong. So, but model-free methods, they are robust to that because they don't even model the, the transition function. And then they are much easier, much simpler, but the drawback is that they require a lot of data. Uh, they, they tend to require much more data, much more experience with real system than a method that does estimate a model. So that's the main difficulty. Like for example, in Atari games, they, tra they collected data for days of play. Just to play ping pong or like just Pac-Man game, they had to play for hours and hours, which is a lot of data. Um, so, so let's, let's talk, talk about, about, I think we will finish with Q-learning, which is a very basic algorithm and the most used algorithm. And uh, to get there, let's start with this small definition. This is almost the same as Bellman equation. You can say this is Bellman equation. Uh, but the only thing that it has as different from before is that we have as, uh, it is a function of state and action. Okay. We call this the Q-value. What is Q-value of state S and action A is, it is the immediate reward that you will get in state S if you choose action A, plus discount factor times the expected next value, if you, if you do this, if you choose action A in state S, okay? So this is called the Q value, which means what is the advantage, or what is, how good is action A in state S in the long term, not just by taking into account the immediate reward, but taking into account also the next value of the next state which itself is defined recursively. So the Q value is very important because Q learning is based on that. So it came from this. Uh, so the Q value of state S and action A is the immediate reward or cost or how much money you get immediately if you choose action A in state S plus the future rewards, which is different, given recursively like this. Now we want to estimate, if you know this, if you know the Q values, then you know what would be the best thing to do because you can compare your actions. You say, oh, action one has $10, action two has five, I'm going to choose action one. So if you know this thing, then you can solve your reinforcement learning problem. You can just choose the maximum, okay? Um, let's go directly to the essential. You can, this is all how derivations and how it came from, but I'm going to take you exactly to the algorithm of Q-learning because it's very easy and doesn't require all the derivations to understand how it works. Um, so the idea is the following. Okay, we're gonna go step by step on the Q-learning algorithm because it's, it's important. So, let's say we have a Markov decision process, a problem. 
which is defined by state, space, actions, and reward. All this is known. The only thing that we don't know is the transition function. We don't have a model. But we do know the states that we can have, and the actions and the rewards, we know that. We just don't know how the system works, the game works, how we go from state to the next state. Okay? Then we start from state as zero. That's the initial state. And we just repeat this forever and ever. So there is this infinite loop where the agent is always getting better and better. Maybe it will find the optimal policy, but we'll just keep doing this anyway. This is kind of lifelong learning. And then whenever you decide to stop, stop learning and just act, you, you return a policy, which is the best policy, uh, policy pi. Okay? So the way this works is the following. We can initially, and this is what I like about reinforcement learning, you can initialize things as, as randomly as you want, you always convert to very good behavior. So let's start by initializing the Q value function uh, with arbitrary numbers. So Q value of any state and any action, let's put it zero, for example, or anything. Let's start from there. Okay? And then the first thing we do, and we repeat this, and each, each time we have this time counter, this is like seconds, second one, second two, this is like a counter of time. You do something and then time goes on, clicks, and then you go do something else. This is just time going up and up. And each time we choose to do some action, and then at the end we learn the optimal behavior. So how do we do this? So, um, well, we choose, we have this policy pi that is given us the policy that chooses the best action in each state, the best action based on the values, the Q values that we have, which is, could be anything. It could be zero. So this policy pi is not optimal. Initially, it's just some crazy random policy. It's doing anything. <coughs> so we choose an action based on policy pi. So whatever policy pi is telling me to do, I will do it. If policy pi tells me goes to go to a wall, I will go to a wall. So I have this policy, I'm following it, like dumb. However, I'm not following all the time this policy, but I have some small probability for what we call exploration. So we have some probability epsilon for doing novel things, new things. Because if you keep doing the same thing, you will never learn anything new. So you have to explore things. You have this policy by that tells you what to do, uh, but you don't always do what the policy says. You do it with just probability one minus epsilon, but with but probability epsilon, which is, let's say, 1%, let's say 1% of the time, you try something completely new, okay? You try some action at random, and this is how you learn. It's by trying random things, okay? But anyway, either by following policy pi or by doing this crazy random thing, you will choose an action. And let's see what we do this with this action AT. So regardless of how we choose it, we have some action now that we choose. We execute this action. And we observe what is the reward and what is the next state. What is the immediate reward that we get and what is the next state. We observe this in real world. So if you are a robot, you move the robot. If you are uh, investment, you observe what you invested. So you observe the immediate reward and next state. And then you just update the Q values based on this equation. So your new Q value uh, of the state ST and the action that you actually executed right now is 1 minus alpha times the out Q value plus alpha times the new Q value, or new estimate. So it's, it's like you want to preserve what you calculated so far. You don't want to throw it away immediately. You want to keep it. So you keep what you had estimated before. You see that this is the previous estimate of this guy. But you multiply it by 1 minus alpha, uh, just to keep moving uh, history. And then you, you, you take alpha and you multiply it what, but what you just observed, new information that you have. A new information is the immediate reward plus discount times the Q value at the next state that you ended up in. And that's it. So you just repeat this update and eventually you converge to uh, the optimal policy because your policy is always based on the Q values that you, com you computed. Okay? The policy pi is always updated based on the Q values. If you see pi is always defined as argmax of the Q values and that's it. Okay, so I will give you an example of that. Okay, this is another formulation. Let's say you didn't understand my previous equation. This is how you do it. This is another formulation. You choose, you are in some state S, you choose some action, and you get a reward, and you go to a new state, which is ST plus one. So you update the Q values based on this equation. So the new Q value is the out Q value that you had, plus alpha, alpha is some learning rate, which could be 0.5, for example, 
uh, times what? Times the, uh, the reward plus discount factor and the next Q value minus the out Q value that you predicted. So this is what we call temporal difference or error, temporal error. This is what you expect to happen according to your estimated Q value, and this is what you actually observe. You observe reward, and you observe next state ST plus one, and you computed some Q value for next state. So you take the difference between what, you pre your, what your function predicts and what actually happens after you do some action, and you correct. So this is like correction. You correct the out Q value by uh, adding this error and multiplying it by alpha. So how do we choose this? Alpha is just some learning rate. So alpha is like some number that is, you can choose alpha just like this. So you can choose alpha t as one over t. So initially it's one, and then it goes to zero, right? So you start with very high uh, update rates, and then you go to zero. Epsilon is important. Epsilon is the exploration probability. I'll show you again in case you missed it. So epsilon is this famous probability that we use for either uh, doing exactly what the policy does or doing something completely random okay for for exploration okay this is what we call epsilon you don't want to be exploring too much you will break your robot if you just do random things you explore too little and you do the right thing to do most of the time okay so exploration should be done wisely should be done like one out of 10 100 actions and the rest of the time you just do what the policy is telling you to do but if you don't explore you don't learn anything so, uh, I'm going to skip this. I will put all these slides for details. Um, so, we go to this concept of exploration exploitation, and then we explain again the, the, the concept here. So, let's say you, you move to some place or you are in some area, and um, well, you move there and you have your favorite place where you go to eat, your favorite restaurant, or your favorite place where you buy your food the usual place, okay, it's okay, you are, you are happy with service and everything, but then there is this new place that opens, okay? So, and then you have this dilemma, should I, should I go to where I'm used to go, where things are safe, I know that the food is clean and everything, or should I go to this new place? And there is risk, it could be bad, but it could be awesome, it could be like the best food you had in your whole life. So, if you just do what you think is optimal, what your model is telling you optimal, you will never find the... The, the, the optimal thing. Maybe this restaurant is a really amazing restaurant, but because you are just doing what you are used to do, or what your model is telling you is the optimal thing to do, then you will miss on these things. So you have to try things that you don't know anything about. If the robot is moving, the robot should try to do random things. Maybe it will figure out some interesting solution, something that is really uh, highly rewarding. So this is what we call the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. And this is exactly what we had here in, in the algorithm, in the Q-learning algorithm. When we choose one minus epsilon, that means that we do what we think is best to do. We choose the maximum action according to our current Q values. And with probability epsilon, we choose something random. Random means just anything. And we have to do this. If we don't do that, then maybe the optimal solution is somewhere uh, that will come out after these random actions. And uh, we have to give it a chance to be discovered. Okay, so this is exploration versus exploitation. Uh, there are different strategies for doing that. Um, I'm going to go directly to the, uh, well, you can, you, it's not difficult to understand. So the thing is that about reinforcement learning, the, the math is very easy. It's mostly the concepts and the ideas that we have. The math is super easy here. Unless you want to analyze the algorithms, how they work, then it takes a lot of, it's very complex if you want to analyze things. Um, let's look into how, the, this slide explains how to explore. So maybe you can explore based on how often you did some action. So let's say some action, you try it, uh, a lot, a lot, then you give it less chance. chance. But let's say some action, you never tried it before. Then, then you give it priority. So basically, you prioritize your actions based on how often you did them in the past. Um, the last thing, which is super important, is this. I'm going to finish with the, this part, which is features, or abstraction, or generalization. How can we generalize? So, so far, we had this MDPs, where we had finite number of states, and if you can just learn how to solve this problem. Real life is not like that. Real life, every state is completely different from what you have seen before. Every moment you see something, you have never seen that thing before, even slightly, right? We never get the same 
state and life as we had in the past. So we should be able to generalize what we learned in the past to new possibilities. We cannot just say, oh, I know that you have to do this if you are here. No, everything can be different. So this is what we call generalization. Uh, I will give you an example of this, very, very simple example. So let's say that your state space is a screenshot. This image, this RGB matrix, this uh, matrix is your state, okay? So this is one possible state, this is another state, this is another state. So if your Q value function takes as the input as a state, okay? And uh, you have, in the previous example, we have discrete number of states. So you can just experience all the states and learn their Q values. But what if you have a huge state space like this one? Here, the state space is so large because you can consider any possible image as a state. Okay? An image of a cat or dog is new state. Any, any arrangement of pixels, any image is a state. And there are so many images in the world that you can imagine. So each one of them is state, which means that when you are playing this game, you can never see exactly the same state again. Sometimes maybe the initial state is the same. You start always from the same initial state in the game. But as you are playing, things will look all the time a little bit different. Right? Where are the dots? Where are the monsters? This is Pac-Man uh, Pac uh, game, by the way. So let's say I know exactly what to do here. My agent has been here before. It, it tried some action, and it got a huge reward. So it knows exactly what to do here. Okay? It, learned, it masters this position. Now we are playing and we get to this position. This doesn't know anything about this position. This is new, okay? We only know this one. Can, can we use the information about this to this one to solve this problem? In principle, they are different. This is one state and this is another state, okay? So if you know to, how to solve this, you have no idea what to do here. Right? So if you consider Q-learning in simple uh, version, which is just consider each state as different state, then whatever you learned here, you throw it away, which is a huge, very terrible thing to do, because you are losing experience. You are, you are learning things and you are not using them. So Q-learning will just take whatever it learned here and forget it when it comes to here, because it says this state doesn't look like this one, so I have no clue what to do here in this new state. However, if you take symmetry, then you can figure out that this configuration is the same like this. It's just mirror, right? So you can see that this image is just mirror of this. It's just symmetrical. So you can just flip your actions, right? So there are things that you can exploit about your problem to make sure that you can generalize to different things, even if they are similar. OK. The the annoying thing is that, follow, if you take Q-learning and you implement it in very basic version, even this state is different, mathematically it's different from the first state. Why, why is that? What? Sorry? Yeah, why is this different instance than this one, first one? No, no, let's, say, let, uh, let's forget about this one, okay? Let's say just this, let's, let's forget about time. Let's say it's not time. You, you just have this frame, and you have this frame, and there are different states. If you don't do anything, you cannot use the Q values that you learned here to solve this problem, although they look very similar. Why? Did somebody spot it? Yes? There is just this one pixel here. That is not the same there. And mathematically, it makes it different. So your Q value function should be more tolerant. It shouldn't be strict. Oh, this one is different. I have no clue how to do that. No, it should say, I don't care really about the pixels exactly. I care more about how far I am from monsters, how far I am. So you need to come up with features, right? So features that will simplify your state, make abstraction of things, don't be too specific. Be a little bit more flexible. So say, say that my state is not given as an image, but it's given as how far I am from the monsters, how far I am from the dots. And then you see that that dot doesn't matter really. So uh, practically these two states, the first one and last one, are similar. So if you know how to, what to do here, you should know what to do here. It's almost the same. So to solve this, and this is uh, the last part, we have to use features. And that's where it gets very interesting. So we so cannot we calculate Q values just on states, but Q values should be based on features of the states. So what are features? You know machine learning. So, so you all have uh, at least some concepts in machine learning. 
and you know that we talk about, a lot about features. So the only thing I have to do here is to write my Q value function, Q of SA, as a function of features of the image and not the image itself. So what kind of features can I use here that will predict the, the reward, the future rewards? Suggestions. So let's say, let's say you want to have your agent know how much future scores or rewards it will get in this configuration. So you want to come up with some characteristics or features that describes this state, but it doesn't have, it shouldn't describe all the details. If you start, if your features describe every single detail, then you'll have too many details, and then you cannot generalize between different, if you, if you learn about something, you cannot use your experience for something else, because you have, your Q value is based on a lot of details and makes things very different. Okay? So for example, if you want to recognize a face, you say, okay, I care about like having something, looks like a hair, okay, some people like me don't have much, and then eyes, and then nose, and something, and it looks like a face. You don't, you don't say face has to have like three centimeters or four centimeters from here to here, and you know, if you start like defining a face by a lot of details, then you lose it. So you just care about important things. So here you can say, for example, the important things is, how far is my player, Pac-Man, from the monsters, we have the ghosts, so these are ghosts, that will eat it, uh, how far I am from the nearest dot, because Pac-Man is trying to get dots, right, this, this white dot. How far I am from my center, how far, so you can throw in all these numbers and you call them uh, features and then you define your Q value function based on these features. So for example, distance to the closest ghost, that's one feature. Distance to the closest dot, <coughs> the number of ghosts. So for example, one feature could be just how many ghosts are there? Two, three, four, five, six. So we have all the possibilities. This is one feature. Another feature is one over the distance to the dot. Uh, another feature, am I inside the tunnel or not? So these are all like attributes that describe the state and we call them features, okay? So once we define the feature, we can calculate the Q value and the value based on these features. So, so this is how we define now the value function. function. It's, it's not, not a function of the state directly, directly. it's, it's function, function of the features of the state. Of the state. Okay? okay? So, so if, if two states, states they have exactly the same features, features they will, we, can, we, can, we know what to do in one state if we knew what to do in the other one. If we learn the optimal action, we figured out what was, what was the most rewarding action in one state, we can, trans we can do the same thing in the other state because my Q value function or my value function as you see, they are function of state and action, and directly, they are function of the features that we do of these states. So, for example, one feature tells me how many ghosts are there. So, if two states have the same number of ghosts, they have the same value for this feature, even if the ghosts they are arranged in different positions. Uh, the other one is distance to the nearest ghost. So, anyway, these are just some characteristics. Now, my Q value function is given by a linear combination of these features. So W1 times F1, W plus W2 times F2, etc. Which means that at the end of learning, the only thing that I want to preserve is these numbers W1, W2, Wn. Weights, these weights. Because then you can give me any state and any action, I can just calculate its features and calculate the Q value of this state. Okay, by multiplying the features by the weights. So the, the point of, uh, this is called um, uh, function approximation. So the point of doing this is to approximate this function as linear combination of some features such that they can easily generalize to new states. So I will finish with how to do this actually uh, with an example and that's all actually. Just to tell you that I know that kept you maybe for too long, but be patient and the last round. But this is important. So, the way you do Q learning when you use features is the following. Uh, in the classical Q learning, the new Q value is the out Q value plus alpha times the difference between what you are predicting and what you are observing. This is how we learn Q values, right, in Q learning. So you always compare your Q current Q value that you have with the reward that you observe, and then you take the difference, and that's how you converge to the real Q values. In, uh, when you use features, okay? When you use features, you don't work directly on the Q values, but you work on the weights. And these weights are what defines the Q values. These weights W are the only thing you care about for 
calculating your Q value. You see that this Q value is completely defined by W1, W2. These functions, they are just some programmed function, something you implement yourself, like how many goals, how many, this is something we know. We know F1, we know F2. The only thing we want to learn is W1, W2, Wn. So what I need to work on is the weights. I want to learn them. So the way I'm going to learn them is the following. I'm gonna, for each feature i, I will update its weight wi by taking the out wi plus alpha, which is learning rate, 0 0.5 or something, times the difference, which is the error, temporal difference, times the feature of that weight i. So wi is the weight that is usually multiplied by fi. Again, w1 is multiplied by f1, w2 is multiplied by f2, wn is multiplied by the fn. So when I will be updating, I will be using F, the feature times the alpha, and I will add it to the weight. And basically, just doing this, you will learn to play interesting things. I will finish with uh, deep. So, so OK, I will show you that if you understood this, you are usually you are around 2013, 2015 in reinforcement learning. You already caught up with 20 years of research in reinforcement learning. And the way I will tell you this is the following. So, so, the Q value, value function, function is linear, linear function, function of features. features. And this and is out method. method. What, what else can, can we, we do? do? We can say we can that Q value function, function is neural network neural function, 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 right? right? We can say, OK, it's not linear function of features, but we can say the Q value is the output of some neural network that takes as input state and action. So we have neural network, we feed it with image, and we feed it with action, and it will predict the Q value at the output. So it's so nonlinear, non complex function. So we can generalize exactly the same method for deeper architectures. And this is the only thing that DeepMind did in addition to some engineering tricks like buffer reply, and they were able to solve the Atari games and video games. So this is DQN algorithm. So we'll finish with this. This was proposed by DeepMind 2013. And this network that you see here is just uh, Q value function. It just computes the Q value functions for different states and different actions. So basically, it's predicting the future rewards and takes us input an image, and then it's a highly nonlinear function. We have convolution layers, fully connected layers, etc., and it gives you Q value. And the way you train it is the following you need an objective function, <coughs> and then you use gradient back propagation that Ahmed explained uh, yesterday. So you take this as your objective function and use backpropagation algorithm to update the weights of the network and it will convert to making exactly an accurate prediction of each action in each state. It will tell you how much points you will gain in each state if you choose any action and then all you have to do is choose the best action, okay? Once you have this train, then all you have to do is take some image and calculate the score that you expect for each action and then choose which one you think is, you predict that's gonna be the best. So the way you do it, you train it, the key thing is just this loss function. What is this loss function that we use for chain network? It's exactly the same thing that we use in Q-learning. It's just the reward plus the discount factor times the Q value of the next state minus the current Q value. So we want this to convert to zero. We want this guy here to be equal to the Q value. And when it is equal, what we have is Bellman equation. We have that recursive equation that you have that says that the Q value is the reward plus gamma times the Q value at next state, okay? So the Q value in state ST should be equal to the reward in state ST plus discount factor times the Q value, the expected Q value in the next state. Bellman equation. So what is this one trying to solve is Bellman equation, the difference between the Q value at current time and the, the reward plus Q value at next time. You use this as your loss function in the neural network. You calculate, you derive your neural network with respect to the weights W that define uh, the neural network, and you converge to small error, and you have deep Q learning. And then there is another variant, uh, which is called dueling architecture. Okay? And then there are questions. So, the, you see that this is not usual uh, deep learning, usual classification problem. Usually what you have is you have ground truth and you have prediction, right? If you train like a classifier using neural network, what you have is some input, some image, and then you have prediction, and then you have the ground truth, and you want to minimize the difference between your prediction and the ground truth. Here you can see that's not usual because both what you have as ground truth, uh, this Q value comes both on this side and on this side. So, so this is what you predict, predict, and this is your target. 
your, your target itself is function of your prediction, but for the next state. Okay? So here you have your prediction for the current state, and then you have your prediction for the next state using again the same network, and you add to it the reward, and this is your target. But it's not, it, it has some problems. It doesn't converge easily. So people proposed the following. They said, okay, let's use two neural networks. Let's call the first one Q prime and second one Q. They are trying to solve the same problem. However, the only difference is this one, I'm going to update it very slowly such that it's stable. All right? I'm going to use very low learning rate for it. It will not change a lot. And this one will be changing much frequently. But they are both trying to converge to the same thing. This is called dueling architecture. And the reason we do this, we want to kind of have something stable here, some stable numbers, uh, like a ground truth. And then this is our prediction. And then this will work like usual classification. Right? So if you try, like for example, to predict if this is face or not, you have the ground truth label, and you have the predicted label, and you have the difference, right? So we try to imitate the same thing by doing two neural networks. One is updated very slowly, and the other one is updated more frequently. And uh, this converts much better than using just DQN. So this is the latest thing in, in deep Q learning. There are some recent progress, but I will stop here. So um, I don't know. I'm sure I exceeded the time. I'm not even going to ask. Um, but what time is it? Only five minutes? I wish I did some more things. I tend to eat more time than people give me. So uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's hear some questions then. Yes.